since New Year's, we've been in kind of a series, of informal series, of looking at the different uh, ways that in Scripture God reminds us that he's making everything new and that uh, uh, he wants to do something new in our lives and, and in our world. And, uh, and um, today, um, I want us to look at a, a passage of Scripture in John 13 in which we get a vision of um, a new way to lead and a new way to do leadership. And I think it's important for us, particularly now in the, in the life of our uh, congregation, where we're, um, we're praying about and we're thinking about for the first time choosing uh, leader, leadership for the church. Uh, it's a very uh, important thing, it's significant, and, uh, um, and it's a step that we're ready to take. And um, I, I noticed that this week, uh, I think we've had almost half the members of the church have been nominated <laughs> to be elders. That, I mean, that says something about the quality of people in this, in this place, you know. Uh, so out of the thousands of people that are members here, they're, they're uh, so, um, and, uh, and this week, um, our nominating committee has been gathering and going through this and praying about it and talking about it and looking at how, how we go forward to find the people that God's calling to, to lead us at this time. And, um, and so in the midst of this, I thought, why don't we look at a new way to do leadership, which um, Jesus models for us. So in, in John 13, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that he wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus said, well, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. Okay, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands, my head too. Every, you know, so send it down. Uh, verse 12. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I've done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than their master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. So Lord, teach us. Teach us from your word. Teach us how we might respond to the people around us, the world that we live, and, uh, and how we might do as you've done and become uh, uh, feet washers in this place. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, this... Um, foot washing experience. I, I have to admit, this is, I'm always a little uncomfortable with this passage. So I don't, I don't preach on this passage all the time, uh, unless it happens to come up in a series and I'm stuck and I have to. Uh, the reason is, is that foot washing does not come natural for me. Um, it's just not something that, uh, like when folks come over to our house, I usually don't do it. Um, I figure they walked across the lawn and it's raining in Seattle, so that's good enough. But, uh, but the, the message here is really, really powerful, especially as we think about how do we serve and how do we lead. Uh, it's important for me. It's important for our whole uh, congregation. Now, the thing that I want to point out in this passage, um, you know, we always think about Jesus washing their feet and and that was kind of a, a dramatic thing to do. But, but I realized something, and that is in this passage, there's a context for it. He, he gets up and washes their feet in the context of betrayal. 
It, it, it starts out by talking about he knew his time had come. He knew that uh, Judas had made a deal with the devil. He knew what was happening, and he did it anyway. He chose to do it in a context of betrayal. And, uh, and it's important for us to know that Jesus is aware of our real lives. He's aware of our real issues. He's aware of the things that we struggle with. He's aware of, of what's going on. It's not like he gives us a religious practice to do that's just kind of floating out there, uh, oblivious to what's really happening in our lives. We have to understand his radical action of washing their feet in the middle of dinner, not before dinner, this is like right in the middle of it, um, in the context of this betrayal that's taking place. Um, now, betrayal is uh, um, probably one of the most painful things that we go through in relationships. Because when we betray someone, we, we treat a friend as if they're a stranger. We treat a friend as if we don't know who they are. All, all the experiences, uh, the things we've gone through together, the, the, all of those things are set aside and, um, and, the, and the relationship becomes twisted in an act of betrayal. So it's very, very insidious. And uh, one of the most graphic uh, examples of evil that we probably have uh, in our lives. And unfortunately, you know, if we were to sit around and share about it, it's happened to all of us. And, and we've been the betrayer many times. And, uh, and we, we share that, that commonality. Now, I think I told you, Eileen and I once were um, in Crete, uh, leading a group of uh, folks on this, you know, travels of Paul. I guess he went to the beach a lot, you know, <laughs> Greek islands. But um, so we're in Crete, and we had a guide, a fabulous guide named Evangelista. And, uh, and he was so good. And, um, and he explained to us that um, on their island and their custom and their language, whenever you, you met a stranger, you, you considered them an honored guest. He said, in our language, the word for stranger and the word for honored guest is, is one and the same. And then he said, isn't that the way it is for you Americans? <laughs> and I, I thought, no, actually, when we say stranger, we mean strange. <laughs> Whoa, watch out. I don't know. Keep away. You know, they got to get their way. And, and, and I realized that we have a totally different uh, approach to strangers, and we hold them at a distance until we have some some uh, sense of safety or control in the relationship. For for them on Crete, it's oh my goodness, here's a stranger. Let's welcome them in. This is uh, their honored guests in, in our presence. And uh, I think that that um, is so endearing that that we can um, approach people in a way that. Uh, that nurtures and strengthens and encourages them and includes them and not put up walls and barriers to keep people away so that we're so that we're self-protected. Um, now to do this, it requires some humility, and uh, I know that I have never preached on humility, <laughs> humility and how I achieved it. You know? um, <laughs> but uh, that's the new book. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But, but humility is, a, is an interesting thing because uh, we also have experiences of humiliation, don't we? And that's very different. And sometimes we don't want to uh, experience humility because we're afraid that it's going to turn into humiliation very, very easily. Um, I was in a small group for many years with a group of uh, really cool, troubled pastors. And... Uh, um, one of them, Doug Webster, uh, is a, a professor now at um, Beeson Theological Seminary in, the, in Alabama. But in one of his books uh, so called Soulcraft, How God Shapes Us Through Relationships, this is what he says. Um, humility is not humiliation. In fact, it's just the opposite. Humility bows the need to God. Humiliation results from rejecting God. Humility receives God's word. Humiliation denies God's word. Humility leads to hope. Humiliation leads to despair. 
Humility frees us, frees us from the subtle, manipulative, and destructive powers of humiliation. We actually, this is what he writes, we actually become free and hopeful if we would humble ourselves. And yet that remains a very rare, rare experience in our lives uh, and in our world. Um, that we actually become free if we choose humility. Now, in this passage, um, Jesus, in this foot washing, I, I don't know how to say it exactly. It, he takes um, the radical choice of choosing uh, a posture of humility even though he knows his life is soon to be over, he's being betrayed by at least one of the people there, maybe more, uh, and there hasn't uh, been uh, the response among his disciples that he wanted. He continually kept saying, how long have you been with me? You don't get it yet, you know? And, and what do I have to do? What do I have to say? And yet he chose to get up from the table and uh, wash, wash the feet. To, to choose to do something that's so incredibly um, powerful that says to them, I will treat you like an honored guest even though you may be the betrayer. I'm going to treat you as the honored guest. And I think in doing that, when we do that, if we, if we choose uh, a servant ministry, we're saying to people, uh, we're the same. We belong together. Uh, we're not better than you. Uh, you're not worse than us. We're in this together. It's a radical statement of we're in this together. And uh, I remember uh, a few years ago, a pastor in a big old church and a lot of uh, successful business people were in it and uh, and one day one of the CEOs in the congregation came to see me and I was really glad talking with him and everything and he said I just want to tell you I have one concern about your pastoral ministry I think I've told you this so let me say it anyway uh, and, he, and he said uh, I've been watching you when at a church gatherings and dinners and things like that and the thing I, I'm really concerned about the way you're relating in this congregation because it sends the wrong message to our community and to the people. You've been going around pouring coffee at the dinners and sometimes you pick up the plates and clear the tables and but you're going around with coffee and you see when someone's cup is a little low and you pour coffee in it. He said, I'm horrified by this. I'm sitting there going, what the hell? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and, 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 and he said, uh, you know, I, I said, well, you know, people need to, you know, get their cup filled. What's the big deal, you know? And, and he goes, I know that. And, you know, I'm a leader in my company. And I'm, I'm aware when someone needs their drink refreshed. And I tell one of my uh, lower level staff people to go and take care of it. Said, That's what you need to do as the pastor. Or else the people in the congregation are going to think that you're not really pastor material because you're pouring coffee. Rarely have I thought someone was as stupid as that. You know, <laughs> I bet it just keeps coming back to me because of how can someone get it so wrong, so opposite of what Jesus has in mind. Um, In foot washing, we, we take our lives and we submit it to the Lord. We, we take who we are and what we've been through and all of our struggles and issues and successes and failures and hopes and dreams. We take all of that and we say, okay, Lord, it all belongs to you. It doesn't matter. It belongs to you. What would you have me do now in this situation? And then it's up to the Lord to show you what, what, he, what he would have you do. Now, um, I, I am always looking for sermon illustrations, and, uh, and this week, I can't help it, I, one of them just was thrown at me. Um, 
Tuesday, Jana came to our staff meeting and uh, and she reported that we have a big problem in the church that may shut the church down. And she took me downstairs in the fellowship hall where the kids, it's their indoor playground on rainy days for the preschool. And up in the ceiling, the ceiling was starting to rot and it was black with mold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I said. Mm. Mm. Well, what about that? Well, let's let that go for a while. Maybe it will take care of itself. <laughs> you know, well, that didn't happen. So uh, so we got to do something. I didn't know what to do. You know, we don't have the money to go out and hire some company to come in here. So, um, so uh, Wednesday morning, the next day, I was here for the men's Bible study. And, uh, and as we're finishing up our study in the Proverbs, I said, you know, I got can I show you guys this? You know, and I took them down into the fellowship hall and showed them the ceiling, and they went, "Oh, wow, oh, that's bad. There's mold up there, going through the ceiling. Ah, oh, that's bad." And then they started to leave, and uh, and uh, one of them, uh, Dave, Dave Doherty, he's not here, so I can tell the story. <laughs> he's the one who invited you guys today. So, um, so. Uh, he said, John, you know, I've got some time right now. I think uh, maybe I can look into it and see, you know, just what it is and what's happening up there. So I said, oh, man, thank you. Thank you. He worked for three days, cutting out the ceiling, and sure enough, <laughs> just black mold, you know, really bad and everything. And then he couldn't figure out where the moisture was coming from and uh, tore it out. And the next day I came back, and he, and he goes, John, I got to show, I found the leak. And uh, he took me into the men's bathroom, into the stall there, and he had dismantled the ugliest, oldest toilet I'd ever seen in my life. And uh, it was all taken apart and everything, and he showed me, it was really gross, and he showed me the, uh, the how it was leaking down into the ceiling. And I uh, said, well, I think, you know, we can fix this, and we can fix this toilet, and we can do, you know, the third day, he worked on it and uh, said, I got it fixed and everything. Now, I, Friday, I was volunteering at the preschool, so I took the kids and gave them, you want to see what's up inside a ceiling, kids? You know, hey, hey look, up, look up here, see that ladder, get up on the ladder, you can see, you know, and there's a leak, and, uh, and, the, and then the teacher said, well, can you show them where the leak's coming from? I went, well, if you want to, okay. <laughs> and so uh, I brought him upstairs into the bathroom, and then the teacher was horrified, you know. Uh, and, I show, and they're looking at this toilet, and I'm saying, this is where it was. And, everything. and, uh, and, uh, and then, um, the other day, I walked into my office uh, down the hall there, and um, this was sitting on my chair. Now you know about the gloves. <laughs> I'm not touching this thing. This thing is really gross. It really is, seriously. And it, it was says, Dear John, <laughs> bathroom humor, uh, Dear John, no longer do the men of Harbor Church have to fear an unanticipated yet necessary trip to the men's room. Your bro, Dave. <laughs> he fixed it. He fixed it all. He, he changed it all, and now there's uh, cleanliness and health, and the mold's gone, and the ceiling's back up, and it's all been repaired, and the kids can play, and it's healthy. And I thought, my goodness, three days he took doing this, digging around in the ugliest, worst, messiest, probably dangerous work. Not a complaint. I was saying, oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. You know what he said? Oh, it was fun to do. <laughs> this shows he's insane. But, you know, I'm just saying, you know. But, but here's what he did. He, he said, it's, not the, it's not like let's call somebody who's low level and have them get up there and do this and I'll supervise it. That's my way of doing it, you know. But uh, it's more of a, well, let's do whatever it takes. Let's just get into it and whatever it takes, that's what we'll tackle. Now, to me, I went, wow, this is a sermon, thank you, Lord, this is a sermon illustration of servant leadership. 
It's, it's, it's what we do. We get into stuff, and I'll tell you what, if you reach out and, and begin a conversation with someone and, uh, and you let them into your life and you develop a relationship, I guarantee you it will get messy. It will. It is not going to be a pleasant thing all the time. I haven't been in a relationship yet that hasn't gotten messy. And you and you want to come to a church? You know, come to a Harvard church. You know, what a great. This is the place where everything never gets messy, right? <laughs> no, you know what? But but what we've done is we've said, okay, Lord, you're in this. We're going to walk through this together. Right? We're going to go through this, and whatever we come upon, we're going to walk through it with you. Right? Now, what, what is it that goes into um, this new kind of leadership? First of all, it's never, ever forced on us. Foot washing, servant leadership is not something that's forced on us. It's something that we choose realizing what we're getting into. It's our choice. And um, in, in verse 3 there, I love this. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He knew that he'd come from God, and he knew he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, right? He knew uh, this was his choice. Um, and, and it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, choice to make because it shows that we have freedom to serve, and it's never forced on us. The second one is, that it's grounded in relationships. Up in, in verse one, it says, um, Jesus knew that uh, it's time to come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. In, in the context of the relationship, we can demonstrate love in tangible ways that get us into situations that are messy and sometimes we feel over our head and we go oh, whoa how do we get into this you know and but we go in it together because the relationship matters because uh, we love them and we want we want to demonstrate love in tangible ways um, it's not enough to just uh, have a loving attitude you know it has to be demonstrated now the, the third thing I want to point out here is that Servant leadership takes place not in ignorance, not in cultural and relational blindness. Uh, it, said, it says that uh, Jesus was aware. He was told, he knew. Over and over it says this. Jesus knew. Jesus knew. Jesus was aware of that. And the, and and. and he knew the reality of evil. He knew the reality of sin, of betrayal. He knew the reality of Satan's power and presence. And he did it anyway. We can't say, oh, everybody's great. We're all getting better a little at a time. Let's all just wish each other well and be happy people. And then we'll kind of serve each other in our mutual happiness. Is that we go, wow, you know, life can really hurt us. And it, and it can get bad, and people can turn on us, and situations can get bad, and there's real evil, and there is betrayal, and there's all these things happening. I'll do it anyway. That's servant leadership. It's not, as soon as we get all these problems worked out, then we'll practice servant leadership. No, you practice it in the context of a very evil world with, with uh, people that can go sideways real quickly. And I've been a pastor a lot of years. I understand people going sideways. It's like, wow, really? Yes. Yes, actually. And it's not all smiles. And, uh, but we have to choose to move toward them anyway. Move toward people and, and uh, get up from the table. And put on the towel and, and jump in. And finally, um, it's not just an attitude, it's an action. Verse 17, now you know these things. You'll be blessed if you think about them for a while during your quiet time. 
Wait. Does yours say that? Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you consider ways that other people might do this. <laughs> I like that one. That's a good translation. How about this one? Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you realize it's not really necessary because there's others who can step in. <laughs> now that you know these things, you'll be blessed, Jesus says, if you can find people like Dave who will step up and do it. <laughs> right? No, see? Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. It's the action. And the blessing, the joy, our life fullness is in the doing. It's not in the thinking about it or trying to recruit someone else to do it or make sure it's taken care of in some way. It's in the doing, right? I'm so glad Dave wasn't here today because otherwise I probably couldn't have told that story, you know? <laughs> so I can talk behind his back. Okay. He'll never know. He'll never know. He'll never. Watch in the video. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if there's any a low level person who wants to carry this out to the trash, <laughs> actually, I had thrown the toilet seat away. I got. I threw it in the trash. I thought this is stupid. And I threw it in the trash. And then yesterday, wait. The Lord can use even a bad toilet seat. <laughs> you know. I'm gonna go get it. <laughs> But, um, okay, so the new leadership, and as we think about this, it's so important because uh, serving is never uh, fancy and it's never clean. It's always messy, it's always a struggle, and it's always in the context of evil. <coughs> but that's what the blessing is. So that's our call. All right, pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your demonstration of your love. We thank you for the way you, you make things tangible and challenge us. And we thank you that you don't let us settle back and wait for things to be taken care of. But you call us to move toward people and move towards problems and move towards relationships and, and do it in love. So give us the courage to choose, to choose to be your servant leaders. And, uh, and bless us as we do that in Jesus' name.